Um, so first of all, thank you for coming out on your Saturday morning to, to talk about politics That's uh, or talk about uh, uh, what's going on in the state. Um, I go back to Topeka on Monday. Uh, we already have a speaker picked, so I promise we're going right to work. Um, we're, uh, um, go what happens tomorrow is they, at, at noon, they're going to be swearing in all the state officers, um, including our brand new uh, state school board member, um, Danny Zek, which I'm really excited about, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about. Um, but then at 2 o'clock, uh, we go into the chamber, we swear in uh, all of the legislators, uh, we vote on our speaker and majority leader and all that, but it's all already happened. You know, the choices have already been made. It's just a matter of, uh, of uh, ratifying the choices that were made in caucus. So we shouldn't have any of the drama that we're going to have, uh, that we had in uh, D.C. over the last couple weeks. Um, yeah, darn it. Um, I want to I wanna talk for a few minutes um, about uh, some school stuff because uh, it's kind of blown up here. If you ha are on my email list, uh, you know all about it. If you're not on my email list, please put your email on the, uh, on the, uh, the, the sign-in sheet there and I'll get you on my email list. But um, we've uh, uh, had some drama there. And then I also wanna talk a little bit about uh, property taxes because that's gonna be a big focus for me uh, when I go back. And uh, after that, uh, I'm going to open it up to questions and we'll talk about whatever you want to talk about. And if you don't have any questions, I'll keep prattling on to fill up the hour. But uh, um, so the schools, um, you know, we, we've got, it's really kind of a tale of two cities right now with our school boards. You know, we had uh, municipal elections two years ago and over in Lansing, uh, we got three great conservatives elected to the school board and uh, with the one conservative that was already there, they now have a majority. And it's been kind of awesome because uh, first thing they did was they changed leadership in the board. Uh, they've already passed a parent's bill of rights. They've already removed some uh, CRT related stuff from the curriculum. It's really awesome. I mean, we're really making progress in getting all the political nonsense out of the schools and getting back to reading, writing, and arithmetic. Um, in Leavenworth, uh, we got two great conservatives uh, elected to the school board, um, but it's not enough to make it a majority. Uh, we got a couple folks that are uh, kind of go back and forth, and then we've got uh, three hard Democrats on the school board, and uh, we've, we've been fighting tooth and nail. Um, I'm happy to report that uh, one of our great school board members, Vanessa Reed, got a, uh, was able to get three folks to vote with her, you know, Alyssa Murphy, who's uh, you know, pretty conservative, but then the other two, um, and they were able to not raise our property taxes this year uh, at the school board level, which is almost half of your property taxes. So that's great, but on a lot of these other policy issues, especially like all this CRT and social emotional learning and all that stuff that's going on in the schools, uh, they don't have a majority to do that. The reason I'm talking about that, first of all, is because uh, we've got municipal elections coming up this November, and uh, uh, you know we're, we're looking for great conservatives to run for that school board, so if you're interested in running for the school board, please give me a call. But also, these elections matter. You know, us, us Republicans and us conservatives, um, we've been guilty for a long time of not paying attention to odd year elections. Uh, and that we changed that last year. Um, I'm hoping we can continue that momentum this year, and I'm gonna be fighting really hard uh, to do that. But uh, what's going on in the board right now, and the reason I'm talking about it right this instant, is on Monday, um, they're gonna vote on a policy. And if you're on my mailing list or you've seen on Facebook, um, they're gonna vote on a policy to take away our rights, if we don't have kids in the school, to complain about materials being taught in our schools. And on its face, like, well, golly, what, you know, why is it a concern to you if your kid's not in the school, what's being taught in the school? Well, you know what? Those kids are our, our future, not just the future of the parents, the future of the entire city, but also we're all taxpayers, and we're paying for the materials that are being taught in the schools. And I don't know about you, um, I don't want my tax dollars being used to indoctrinate kids with all kinds of you know crazy notions about you know gender fluidity and all that nonsense so um, I want them I want my do tax dollars used to teach my kid uh, our kids to uh, you know to read and write and do math 
and be successful in a 21st century economy. Uh, that's what I want my money used for. And I think that everybody who pays taxes in the school district, because like I said, more than 50% of your, or about 50% of your property taxes are paid to the school. If you live outside the city limits, well more than 50% of your tax dollars are uh, going to the school. You have a say whether you have a kid in the school or not. But what they're trying to do, um, the board president, Judy Price, and uh, the uh, superintendent, Mike Roth, are trying to take away your right to object to material taught in the school if you're not a parent or guardian of a student in the school. And I frankly think that that's, that's taxation without representation, right? We, we have a voice in what gets taught in our schools, and we have the, we have the right under the U.S. Constitution to redress our grievances to our government. And the idea that we can't object to things in our school, to me, is just anathema to, to democracy, to our former representative government. So if you agree with me, if that fires you up too, um, I absolutely encourage you to contact your school board members. Um, the one's here, um, but she's on the right side of the issue. Um, if, you, uh, if you don't know how to contact them on my Facebook page, uh, I think it was uh, yesterday, last night, I put up all their contact info. If you're on my mailing list, check your email. Uh, there's, a, a pay, you know, there's an email where you can just click on a button and you can email your school board members. Let them know what you think about this. Um, if you don't let them know, they're gonna ram it through because they're gonna say, okay, well, people don't care. So it must be okay. So we've got to make our voices heard on that. Um, and you might be thinking, you know, well, why, why is Pat Proctor state representative talking about that? Well, first of all, I'm a taxpayer in the Leavenworth School District, uh, just like all of you. So I'm, I'm concerned about this on that level. But also, um, you know, until we can break the deadlock up in Topeka on a lot of these issues, and I'm going to talk about a couple of them here in a minute, this is the only way we're going to get stuff done is at the local level at our local school boards. And frankly, I think that's the, the best place to address a lot of these local governance and these administration issues. Um, so what am I gonna do in Topeka about schools? Well, that's a good question. Um, I, uh, you know, I talked last year about this a lot and I'm really disappointed that we didn't get this done last year. And I wanna talk a little bit about why that is. But um, two things that we were working on hard last year that didn't get done was a parent's bill of rights and fairness in women's sports. Um, fairness in women's sports, I, I think, you know, it, it confounds me that we haven't already gotten that done. Uh, we passed it twice last year. It got vetoed twice by the governor and we weren't able to override the veto. The last time we fell three votes short and since then we've lost one Republican seat in the House. So we're one down. So um, the question's going to be, those, you know, we got a lot of new folks in. We got rid of like four or five moderates uh, in the House. Are those new folks that have come in going to give us the momentum to get over the hump? Because we, we really need every vote. We can lose one vote and still override the veto in the House. Um, what, the, what the fairness in women's sports does is, to me, just common sense. You know, I mean, uh, if you're built, if you're born a biological male, you should not be able to compete in, in girls and women's school sports. I mean, it, you know, and it's not, it's not about discriminating about, against trans girls and women. It's about uh, basic fairness. And that, ba you know, that, those sports are not just, uh, you know, they're, they're great for kids and they're great for their, uh, you know, for their learning and for their learning to, Grow is you know grow with a team and learning to be a part of an organization, but they're also about money, frankly, because uh, you know scholarships get awarded based on how you do in high school sports to going to college and going to college you know it, theoretically not as much anymore unfortunately but theoretically is the gateway to economic opportunity as an adult, and so when you put uh, biological men in these sports with girls, they have an unfair advantage because, you know, just the, the physics and biology of being a human male versus a human female for the first 13, 14, 15, 16 years of your life um, gives you a, a distinct advantage over girls and women competing in stort, sports that require strength and speed. Um, I, uh, like I said, you know, we got it done twice, uh, but we weren't able to override the veto. 
I'm going to come back around after I talk about Parents' Bill of Rights and talk about why that is. But, you know, the governor knows she's on the wrong side of this issue. Because if you remember, when she was running ads, you know, the first thing she said is, of course, uh, of course I'm against men competing in women's sports. Now afterwards, you know, her, her staff went behind her and parsed it and said, well, you know, uh, trans women aren't men. So she didn't, you know, okay, she knows she's on the wrong side of this issue. She knows she's playing defense on this issue. And, you know, she's, she's talking like a Republican a little bit right now, talking about cutting our taxes. So maybe, you know, maybe she's going to have a change of heart here now that she's not up for re-election. Um, and can't stand for re-election, but uh, we'll see. Um, I'm not confident, let's just say that. I'm not confident that she's going to buck her party, which is adamantly opposed to this for some reason that I can't, I can't fathom. Um, Parents' Bill of Rights is the other thing that I'm hoping we're going to get done this year. This is another one that we passed before uh, that she vetoed that we weren't able to override the veto on. Um, I, you know, it's... I would like, if, if it were a perfect world and I got to choose, I would like a really long bill with a whole lot of specifics that say this is how you put parents back in control of their schools and of their kids and their kids' education. Um, you know, things like you have to put the curriculum on the internet, you have to make it, you know, all of the books that are in the library have to be available for parents to look at. All the books that kids are assigned in school have to be available online for parents to look at. Because parents don't have time to go into the school, uh, you know, find the right person, get permission to see the curriculum, wait for them to bring it out, you know, which probably ain't going to happen the same day, and then sit there and leaf through hundreds of pages of curricula. That's, that's just not practical. It needs to be online. And when we started uh, this discussion last year, that's how the bill looked, uh, was it had a lot of specifics. Another thing that I think specifically that it, it, uh, that it required that I think is really important is parents being able to see the surveys that their kids are being given. Because if you don't believe that a lot of outside organizations and companies outside of the school are collecting information on your kid, you're, you're fooling yourself. You know, kids now, they get a computer. On the computer is all kinds of Google materials and Google, uh, you know, it's basically a Google exclusive computer and uh, everything that your kid puts in there is being collected and, and uh, categorized and databased by Google. And that's going to follow your kid the rest of their life. And if they're being asked questions about their sexual identity or their sexual orientation or whether they identify as this or that, or even their preferences and likes, we as taxpayers are paying to give uh, Google a database to sell to every company in the world about our kids and every government in the world, including China and all these other places, right? I think that, that, I think that parents should have some say in that. Right now it's all opt out, right? Hey, we're gonna do it, and if you don't like it, you, know, you can opt out, assuming that you even know that it's happening. And um, I would like to see all these things be opt in. I'd like to see that in statute. Now, all of that having been said, that's not where most of the the house is at right now. Where most of the house is, is with a much more modest bill, which puts it all in the hands of local school boards without any, you know, real edicts about how it's done. Um, you know, there's a, there was a bill last year with 12 simple principles. Um, you know, things like parents have a right to know if their kids are getting uh, medication in the school. Parents have a right to object to that. Parents have a right to object to material being taught in their schools. They have the, the right to see the materials being taught in their schools. Um, you know, there's a, a, you know, it's very general and really a lot of broad principles that I think everybody can agree on. And where the, the majority of the house is, is let's just give school boards these basic 12 principles and let them decide how to implement them. And so if we pass anything, that's what we passed last year. It got vetoed and we weren't able to override the veto, but that's, that's kind of where the majority of the House is on that issue. And that's where I think it's gonna end up again this year. But I'm, gonna, I'm telling you, and I told you during the campaign, I'm gonna fight 
for much more, uh, much more explicit guidance to schools on how they have to implement. It's not because I don't trust the school board members or the individual school boards. It's because first, every school board isn't like the Leavenworth and Lansing school board. You've got schools down in Wyandotte and schools down in uh, Johnson County that you know the school boards are completely dominated by you know by folks that think that all this craziness that's going on in our schools is perfectly fine and it's great and it's wonderful and you know there's also a component of state tax dollars that go to schools and I don't want my state tax dollars going to that either and so I want to put that back in the hands of parents and give parents back control of their kids education um, but again that's not where the house is at I think that what we're if we end up with anything it's probably going to be those 12 broad principles the other thing that I wanted to talk about uh, before I open it up very quickly is property taxes. Um, a big priority for the legislature this year is, and it was our priority last year too, excuse me, and frankly the year before that, yeah, you know, we have these huge tax windfalls that are coming into the state right now. Um, I think the la this, this last month, December, it was something like 100 or 150 million more than estimates coming in in taxes to the state. That's not our, that's not the government's money. That's your money, right? That's our money. And we need to get that back in your pocket so that you can combat these rising prices. And so um, I've, uh, a, big, a big focus of the legislature was giving that money back. Uh, we cut the food sales tax. It went down on January 1st, two and a half percent. It's on its way to zero. Um, we've done about a billion dollars in tax relief. Some of it targeted some of it just blanket like uh, uh, my first year in we uh, um, we gave you back the trap the trump tax cuts because of a a, a a quirk in kansas law if you itemized federally you had to itemize the, the state and it was preventing people from taking full advantage of the trump tax cuts we decoupled those so that you could get the you could get tax relief on both ends um, there's also you know i did the historic tax credit uh, program here for uh, rural uh, uh, rural historic districts like ours um, in the last session. There's a you know, we, we also did low income housing uh, uh, tax credits to get more housing. Um, a lot of a lot of targeted tax relief, but um, there's a lot more to do. And I think that the focus should be on property taxes because I don't know about you, but I'm getting killed by property taxes. I mean, my house has gone up 13 percent every year. Um, you know, all I do is mow the lawn. I feel like I should stop mowing the lawn. It's, it's, it's less expensive to pay the fine than it is to pay the property taxes. So um, we got to do something about it. Um, we, last year um, in the legislature, we expanded the homestead uh, property tax uh, credit. So if you're over 65 or you were a disabled veteran, um, it used to be you had to make less than 50000 and your house had to be under, I think, 150000 We raised the value to the ha of the house to 350000 and we wanted to raise the $50,000, uh, uh, but what we ended up with to get it passed was just tying that 50000 to inflation. So it will go up with inflation, but that's not really giving people much more access to those tax credits. So uh, this, this session, I'm going to be uh, introducing a bill to expand the disabled veteran tax credit so that more disabled veterans can take advantage of that. Um, it's basically gonna be keyed to how disabled you are um, as to how much relief you can get, but there's no longer gonna be an income limit on it. So that will get a lot more folks access. But honestly, I want tax relief for everybody, not just disabled veterans, because we all need tax relief, uh, you know, whether we served or not. And so um, there's a challenge with uh, with uh, doing property tax relief. You know, last year uh, we did this uh, um, truth in taxation. And uh, I talked a lot about it during the campaign. Basically, it makes school boards, city commissions, and county commissions accountable for our taxes going up. It used to be the assessor raises your property value 15%. And the city had just sit in their hands and not raise the mill levy and their taxes, their tax income would go up 15%. And they say, well, I didn't raise your taxes. Go talk to that guy. Well, that guy's not elected. The, the city commissioners, the county commissioners, the school boards are. And so what we did last year is we uh, made 
all those municipal units of government, they have to affirmatively vote yes to raise your taxes, to take in more taxes than they did the year before. And if they don't, then the mill levy automatically drops so that they don't take in any more than they did before, which is called revenue neutral. And it's already working. Uh, the Lansing City Council last year voted to be revenue neutral. The Leavenworth School Board voted to be revenue neutral. So it's having an impact. Um, and the other units government, the Leavenworth City Commission, the, uh, um, the county, they dropped their mill levies way more than they have in a long time. So it's having an impact. But really, that's all duct tape and bailing wire, right? We're trying, what we're trying to do is we're trying to account for the fact that our property assessments are broken, that our valuation system is broken. And so what we really need to do is we need to fix the valuations. Um, the challenge is that some genius wrote into the Kansas Constitution property valuations. I don't know why that is. I'm sure there's a history to it, but somebody put valuations in the Kansas Constitution. So we can't just pass a bill in the legislature to fix valuations. We have to fix the Constitution. And if you remember from last election, we're batting 300 on changing the, the Constitution, right? It's very hard to change the Constitution. If you, I heard it about a thousand times you know, during the, during the election cycle. Man, it's so complicated. Why can't you just make the language simpler in the, on the ballot, you know, and then it would be easier to vote on these constitutional amendments? Well, you have to put exactly in the, on the ballot what language you want to put in the Constitution. And, you know, it's going to be legalese. It's going to be constitutional language. It's not going to be, you know, just plain spoken conversation like we have with each other. And so um, that's the big challenge with passing a constitutional amendment. Um, I'm going to be working with, uh, uh, with uh, some folks over in the Senate and some folks in the House. I'm putting together kind of a coalition. Uh, we're going to try to fix this. And what we're going to try to do, um, the, the the challenge in the Kansas Constitution is it says that every property has to be assessed the same. And what I would like to get to is when you buy your house, that's the value of your house. And your house can only go up so much a year until you sell it or you change the square footage. The, uh, um, in California, they've got this thing called Prop 13. It was a ballot initiative from a long time ago that basically does the same thing. In California, you know, if if it weren't for Prop 13, nobody over, you know, nobody would own a house because people bought their houses at 50,000, you know, for a three bedroom, and now they're worth a million and a half. And if they didn't do something to fix the valuations a long time ago, all those seniors that are on fixed incomes would have to move out of California, which they probably are now, anyways. But that's a different story. Um, so that's what I want to do. I want to I want to fix the cost of your house when you buy it, so it can only raise by a certain percentage until you do something significant to change change the square footage or you sell it. Um, that's that's my um, you know that kind of if I get everything that I want, if I get everything that you know I that uh, that I hope and dream of getting done with valuations, that's what I would like to do. But if we do nothing else. We have to take that line out of the Constitution that says uh, all properties are valued the same. Because once you do that, you can't freeze property tax values when somebody turns 65. You can't freeze property values for a disabled veteran or whatever it is you want to do. You can't do any of those things because of how the Kansas Constitution is written right now. And so that's that's what I'm. That's probably not going to happen this session because it goes on a ballot in a year usually and so I'm, this is probably a two-year process to get that done in the meantime I'm going to be fighting on the disabled veteran property tax relief um, once I get that done I'm going to start working on senior tax relief so people aren't getting priced out of their homes um, but uh, it's it's a challenge there there's a organization it's called the Kansas League of Municipalities and all of the city governments belong to it and they're a very powerful lobby up there and they've got the ear of all the Democrats up there because a lot of the city governments are controlled by de Democrats and they fight us tooth and nail on every bit of property tax relief we try to do because so much of the city revenue is uh, is property taxes um, I'm gonna stop there
Uh, so I've got plenty of time for questions, and Tony raised his hand first, so go ahead. No, uh, the thing is, is obviously, logically, if inflation is 8%, just making up a number, and my valuation of property goes up 13%, you don't even have a balance. So how, what's the, throw the idea out is you have appraiser accountability. Yeah. The standards of appraising, attack the appraisers yeah. that are raising it arbitrarily. Yeah. Yeah, so um, the, the rules that are written into the Kansas Constitution um, have a, and the statutes that sort of support it are very prescriptive on how they do the calculation. It's based on municipality. And so I live, you know, right off on Kickapoo, right off of 7th Street. There are a few blocks from the front gate. My, our house prices are not going up much up there. But down uh, at the corner of 20th and Eisenhower, where Riley's putting in these big, beautiful new houses, those houses are going for like 350000 a pop, some of them. Some of them more if they're big. Um, I'm getting valued based on sales prices down there. We're all getting valued based on sales prices down there. And I, I don't, I'm, not, you know, I'm not knocking the Riley's. We need more housing stock. And if folks can afford it, God bless them for living in a nice house. But it's broken. And so, you know, I, it kind of goes back to what I said about passing the constitutional amendment. Yeah, I, I got that part. Yeah. I'm just saying, do a shot across appraisers. Yeah. Appraiser accountability. Yeah. How do you come up with your, I know, yeah. I mean, it's it, 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 yeah. out there. But that's one thought. The other two thoughts were is, is um, I, I talk with several people and I get things because my property jumped up and my, see, I'm retired and I'm locked in my income. And so taxes go up here and here, uh, and when inflation goes up, your credit card interest rates jump up too. So suddenly I got two, three, four, five hundred dollars more expenses, but no new income. Yeah. A friend of mine who's on Social Security got, he says this increase in Social Security was one thing. However, they were on food stamps that went down, and because they live in a government housing, their rent went up. Yeah. based on that. So they ended up with less than they started out with. Yeah, That's one thought. But the other two issues I want to bring to your attention is the idea of Social Security in and of itself being yeah. non-taxable in yeah. Kansas. And that's, you know, uh, uh, the former Attorney General, Derek Schmidt, when he, well, I guess he's still the Attorney General until Monday, <laughs> uh, when he was running, he ran on, uh, on uh, doing away with uh, tax on Social Security. Uh, when the Republican caucus met to decide leadership, everybody was talking about it, we we're going to do it, and now the governor is saying it was all her idea, which is fine. If she'll sign it, it could be her idea, you know, I'll, I'll give her credit, just we got to get that done. And so that's one of the things that we're going to get done this year is uh, doing away with the tax on Social Security. Yeah. He is, if one of the, if you're married, or maybe separate, but if you hit age 70, suddenly either you don't have to pay property tax or it locks in automatically yeah. until you kill all of Yeah, that's exactly, exactly what I plan. Uh, I'm going to do the disabled veteran bill this year because, uh, you know, I, I, I promised the disabled veterans when we did our veteran uh, legislative summit uh, that I would fight for it. And I can only do so, you know, I've got a lot of irons in the fire and that's, uh, I have to lobby myself because nobody's going to lobby uh, for uh, lower property taxes, you know, Kansas municipality is going to lobby against it. Um, but my next bill after I get that passed is doing the same thing for seniors over 65, freezing their property taxes uh, or only a small increase each year maximum uh, because that those are the two most vulnerable groups to because property taxes. Their, the argument for there would be is then you become an attraction state for oh, yeah. retirees, yeah. Yeah. just like you are an attraction state for yeah. uh, military. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, ma'am. I'm not very bright about any of this stuff. Neither am yeah. I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, First of all, I, I would say this. I think you were the best communicators I've ever heard. Thank you. And not only in paper, but also in person. Um, the second thing is um, that I, I've just done in the last couple of years, you know, some major, um, like, renovations on my house, not expanding the square footage, yeah. but it was doing common sense stuff, yeah. you know, cloth repair, yeah. high impact roofs, and stuff like that, which cost me a lot of money. Now, does that necessarily mean that my tax, that my yeah. property taxes will go up? Yeah. 
Well, right now, what's driving these huge increases is not what me or you and our houses up here in Old Leavenworth. It's those new houses that are going in that are, you know, are really expensive. Uh, but theoretically, if the appraiser knows that you put a new roof on your house and it's not, it's like an upgrade from the last roof, he's supposed to raise your values. But right now, he's not, you know, the, the assessor doesn't have to work super hard. I mean, I don't even know who he is, so I'm not insulting the guy. He's following the rules, but, but he doesn't have to work super hard to like raise the valuations because you've got these huge houses going up that cost a lot of money down in the south part of the town. And so he's not really nickel and diamond us on putting in new windows or putting in new, um, you know, if you, they send out a survey and if you don't fill out the survey, you know, I, I'm not telling you not to, but he doesn't know that you did anything because he's not going door to door, you know, like, hey, what'd you do to your house? Because they're getting such huge valuation increases already that that 10 or, you know, 10 or 15 bucks that they're going to get off of your new roof is not a big deal to them. Um, but I honestly, um, I, I think that uh, the ultimate solution to this problem. You know, I, I've heard the joke before, you know, the guy gets the property assessment and he goes back to the county and says, is this an offer on my house? You know, because it's so much higher than, you know, uh, um, I think that the value, the value increases on your house right now are unrealized value, right? You, you can't sell your, I cannot sell my house for what the property assessor values my house at because the neighborhood I live in, the, you know, I mean, folks in my block are wonderful people, but right across the street, you know, Ottawa apartments, we've had several shootings, you know, it's kind of kind of a tough market in my neighborhood to sell my house. I'm not moving, but that's that's the, the fact. And so where we got to get to is when you buy your house, that's the value of your house, plus maybe a little bit, you know, for inflation. But- uh, Make that retroactive, not yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's 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 my ultimate goal. I don't know that I can get there, but that's ultimately what I got to do. But really, anything fundamental, and that's the message I'm trying to communicate. Anything fundamental that you want to do with property taxes is going to require a constitutional amendment. And I got a lot of I got a lot of help over on the other side. Karen Tyson's been talking about this. She's the tax chair in the Senate. She's been talking about this for years. So I think I'm going to have plenty of help. You have a question? Um, I was just. One of my concerns with um, the the growth in Lovemore County, which I'm excited to see, yeah. and I'm excited to see um, some of the things that you're standing on, um, uh, the value of the both, of the protecting the unborn, and also bringing in um, veterans and the, that have our constitutional values. Yeah. Um, bringing in businesses. How do we? protect our constitutional rights, our values, yeah. when we're bringing in so many other yeah. people yeah. that may not have those. Yeah. Do people that, when jobs are being brought into this community, how do you know that people here are being employed and not people from outside? Yeah. Now that, that's a great question. Um, there's, two, there's two pieces that I want to talk about, the veterans piece, and then I want to talk about the folks that are coming in to work you know, from the, then these new companies are going up. Um, so the, a lot of people don't know this. Um, I've got uh, now with redistricting, the entirety of Fort Leavenworth is now in our district, right? There's about 10,000 people that live on Fort Leavenworth. Only about a thousand of them are Kansas residents. And most of those are the retirees that stayed in their houses after they moved out. Because of the Servicemen Civil Relief Act, um, a service member can choose whatever state they want as their state of residence, and they all choose Texas because there's no income tax there. And so one of the bills I'm working on this year is a bill to exempt active guard and reserve military pay, all of it, so that we can get some of these folks to become Kansas residents. The reason is, well, first of all, it didn't cost any money because they're already not paying taxes here, right? So it's free. But once they become Kansas residents, They'll get all their driver's licenses here. They'll get all their cars tagged here. So you're getting all those fees and revenue for that. But more importantly, I want them to come back, right? Because you know the, the, the folks that come through Fort Leavenworth, they're highly educated. 
They've got, you know, their families are usually highly educated. Their, their spouses frequently have professional degrees. And they've got great health insurance for their entire life because when they retire, they get to bring either veterans benefit, VA benefits, or TRICARE, mostly TRICARE now that the war's over. They get to keep those benefits. And so right now we don't have a hospital because we got too many uninsured people here. We don't have enough uh, paying customers to prop up a, ho a hospital. If we get all those residents to come back here when they separate from the military, they come with their health insurance, maybe we'll get our, our hospital back because it can, becomes economically viable to have a hospital here. Um, so as far as you know, getting more of those people to be part of our community and come back here, that's what I'm doing on that front. Uh, military retirement pay is already uh, already uh, uh, tax exempt, and if we tax exempt Social Security, they really don't have a reason to leave anymore. You know, because their their retire pay, um, you know, that's what it's about is getting people to stay here. Now to the 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 no, I'm looking at my watch because I don't want to go over an hour. Um, the the other piece of your question is we're going to have this plant here. Who's coming here, right? Well, God's honest truth, I've got 8,000 people in Leavenworth County who are either unemployed or underemployed uh, because they're trapped in these systems of, you know, that perpetuate poverty like food stamps and, and disability and all these things. Um, I want those folks to go to work at that plant, right? Which is the other reason I want the highway, right? We're, we're getting ready to do public transportation here in, Can in Leavenworth. We've been getting ready for about a year now. Uh, they budgeted the money, but we're waiting on the buses and, you know, with supply chain, really workforce problems, they haven't built the buses yet. But once we get the buses here, we'll have the buses. If we've got a great high-speed avenue of approach from Leavenworth to DeSoto, all of a sudden we can get those folks to work. And they're doing a lot better working at Panasonic and high-paying jobs than they ever were, uh, you know, living on public assistance. The other piece of that is we got to have them educated so that they've got the right skills and training for the jobs down there at DeSoto. We've got a great, uh, we've got a great education center here with the Pioneer uh, Center, the KCKCC branch campus. If we put that together with more educating our kids and less indoctrinating our kids in our high school, we're training our workforce to go work down there. So um, it's a lot of moving pieces that all have to work together, but if we can get it right, a lot of those jobs are going to be filled by our neighbors here in Leavenworth, God willing. Um, but there are going to be people who have to come in, right? And, you know, the right now there's an out-migration from California and New York and an in-migration to states like Texas and Colorado and uh, places like that. Um, we have got to hold on tight to our Kansas values and hold on tight to uh, what makes Kansas a wonderful place to live so that when these new folks come in, we turn them into Kansans. We also have to be welcoming, right? We don't want to be like making it hard to move here and making it hard to live here if you didn't live here for six generations. We got to be welcoming to the folks who come in here so they feel like Kansans, but then we got to show them why Kansas is such a great place to live. And so I, I, think, that, I think that all of the pieces and parts are in place to make this work if we can kind of complete the transformation of our local government with the city government with the school board uh, you know there's uh, some great movement down in baser as well with the school board um, if we can get our cities working together with businesses and with the, the the folks here in town to make this the place where people want to live you know I, I think all the pieces all the pieces are floating around it's just a matter of us is the residents of this town being being active and making it happen? Go ahead. Um, there was talk about a uh, uh, an army museum or uh, some kind of uh, Buffalo Soldier Museum that's going to go off post. Yeah. Um, could you could you talk about that? Maybe yeah. Where that's going to be located and um, and access to it with you know fixing yeah. up some kind of bridge and uh, and then. Anything else along that line yeah, as far as a, like making Leavenworth a destination city for people to come and visit? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up. 
Um, so I had a meeting with uh, Lieutenant General Beagle, who's the new commander at the Combined Arms Center in Fort Leavenworth, the command general. Um, and we had a long talk about uh, the, the museum moving outside post. Uh, this has been something that's been going on, a, a movement that's been going on for several years now, and it looks like it's actually going to happen. Um, it's all foundation money. It's not going to be taxpayer money. It's going to be donations. They've put together a foundation. Right now, they're, they're going to the kind of big donors trying to put together the money to do it. Um, they've already got the spot picked right outside the gate um, to do it in. They just need the money to do it. But what they're going to do is they're going to take the Frontier Army Museum, which right now is across, you know, kind of across from the complex for the Command General Staff Colleges. They're going to move it outside post. And then the Buffalo Soldier Monument, they're going to kind of create a re replica of the, the soldier on the horse, and they're going to put it right out there in front of the museum. And it's going to be available to everybody without having to have gate passes and all the complications to get on post. Now, I also talked to him about getting, uh, getting more access to post for folks, and he's committed to that too. He wants to make it simpler for people from Leavenworth to go on post to, you know, see the post, see the history. You know, that's, it used to be an open post. You used to be able to just drive right in the gate, and it isn't anymore. Um, he wants to get as much back there as he can within kind of the federal constraints that he has. But to your bigger question about making this a destination city, we also have a federal penitentiary that it, we're having a new one built behind it, and you've got this wonderful, beautiful, historic building that's gonna be unoccupied. We've also got the Lansing Correctional Facility right down the road, which, uh, you know, they've built the new prison in the back, and they're talking about knocking down most of the buildings except for the big cell block out front, which is an historic site. Um, I want those to be museums, too. Um, you know, the, the they've got these ghost tour programs where they take old prisons and they bring people overnight, and they, you know, people travel from all over the country to go to Missouri to spend a night in a prison getting the bejesus <laughs> scared out of them. You know, um, they... I, Lansing Correctional Facility is plenty scary. We can scare the bejesus out of them right here in Leavenworth, so or in Lansing. Let's uh, bring them here. Um, I've been working with the Kansas Department of Corrections. I had a meeting with the Secretary of Corrections last week, I think it was, or it may have been a little bit earlier, um, about um, about preserving more of those buildings. The building I really want to save is you know you've got the big cell block out front, and then you've got that long warehouse. That long warehouse is where they used to execute prisoners, including the, the folks from the Truman Capote book, right? So that's an historic site. They've, they, supposedly the gallows are still in there. I hear different stories about where the gallows are, but um, that supposedly the gallows are still in there. I want that to be a museum. Um, I've found some folks here in town that are energized about putting together a similar foundation to do the money for that. Um, and I've talked to the uh, warden out at uh, the U.S. Penitentiary Leavenworth about that big building, and he's interested in the idea of part of it becoming a museum. They're talking about making a lot of the building a training center for the Board of uh, or Bureau of Corrections, or Bureau of Prisons, sorry. And um, so it'll continue to be in use, which is great, because then it'll continue to be maintained. But he, is, he has expressed interest in making part of that, you know, removing that building from the secure area so that he can open it to the public, so part of it will be a museum. And so I'm, I'm working all those things, and I, I, you know, I'm going to have this video on Facebook later, so if anybody's interested in working with me on that, you know, send me a note, because it's going to take us. It's, you know, I, I can go scream and, and yell and vote for money up in, in Topeka, but if we don't have people here in Leavenworth that are interested in making it happen, it won't happen. Okay, last question. I, I don't want to be respectful um, of people's So, um, a lot of people in, that, that lived here used to live kitty land, okay? And bringing something like that back for families, because the museums and the history of this place is great, yeah. but um, bringing, making this a destination yeah. place has been a dream of mine for a long time. Um, but kitty land is something that we could bring back and bring yep. back the nature and the pr preservation of how the homesteads, you know, we could make it something like Soap Dolly City once was, yep. okay? And and I'm wondering yep. your thoughts on that. Well, you know, um, I, I'm going to expand the aperture on that because uh, I, I, that's, that's absolutely 
something to be wonderful to have here. Something else I hear a lot is about grocery stores in North Leavenworth. Um, right now, there's a nonprofit running a bus program to bus people to our grocery stores because we don't have any up north. Um, and I'm always tickled every uh, municipal election cycle, one of the candidates will in a debate say, I'm gonna bring a guy, I'm gonna bring a grocery store to North Leavenworth, or I'm gonna bring this, or I'm gonna bring that. The incentives that bring these things to our town is getting our economy back and getting jobs and getting people with higher incomes in our town. What started me on this journey, you know, all those years ago to becoming a state representative because it was totally not my life plan. Uh, what started me on this journey is that right now our poverty rate is at 20% North Leavenworth and it's rising. And when you become when you get to 33%, you become Detroit. The federal government comes in and you don't ever recover. I mean, the government is terrible at fixing poverty. The government is great at making poverty permanent. And so we're in a race against time to get the economy back and get the dollars back. And when the dollars come back, the kids that leave and go off to college and never come back, they come back to Leavenworth and they have babies. And when you have a hospital, then have their babies in Leavenworth. And then they, those babies can grow up and say, I'm from Leavenworth. And they, you know, they raise their families here too. It, we get all the amenity back, amenities back and everything. And so all, all this, you know, I get a lot of grief on Facebook. Uh, I get a lot of, you know, comments about I'm just doing this for myself or I'm just doing this. Hey, I'm losing money being a state representative. Let me tell you, a lot of money. And my wife reminds me every Monday when I drive <laughs> off to Topeka how much money I'm losing being a state representative. I'm doing it because I want the town to come back. Amen. And I want, you know, I want the people to come back. I want the town to come back. I want the economy to come back and uh, um, get all these things, uh, you know, get all these things moving again so we can have all those amazing. Um, well, thank you, everybody. There's uh, pot stickers and crab rangoon, which I know is why you really showed up today. No, uh, thank you very much for being here today. Appreciate it. Thank you.